We are so honored to be here today with such an amazing group of individuals. Thank you to Terry and all who made this possible. It is a privilege to be able to share our experiences and thoughts with such a motivated and impressive group. Today we want to talk to you about disruption, innovation, and tell you our entrepreneurial story. If we were to ask you who are the greatest disruptors of all time, who comes to mind? Steve Jobs. iPhone changed everything, not just how we listen to music, take taxis, and take pictures. It changed the very fabric of how we live our lives. What about Jeff Bezos? Did you know that 55% of all product searches are started on Amazon? Today, Amazon carries 250 million products. Walmart carries 4.2 million. Amazon is in the music business, the movie business, the cloud computing business, the fashion business, the grocery business, and is aggressively pursuing new innovations. Entrepreneurs and disruptors are everywhere. You don't have to be Jeff or Steve to create revolutionary change. Every corner of every industry is in disruption mode. With the cost to create a new organization dropping to minuscule rates, every business at every time is ripe for revolutionary change. P&G, one of the greatest consumer packaged good companies of all time, is being disrupted every day, as is the hotel industry and even FedEx. 18 years ago, Barry and I had the lucky opportunity to revolutionize the shopping for beauty products with the creation of Blue Mercury. Over the years, we have had the good fortune to work with innovators, revolutionaries, and creatives in the beauty industry. Disruptors are everywhere. Our goal is to have you leave today thinking about what are you going to disrupt today? What is Blue Mercury? Blue Mercury is the fastest growing luxury beauty products and retail spa chain in the nation. This year we're celebrating our 18th anniversary and we just opened our 129th and 130th store this morning. We have over 1,000 employees. As Terry already said, Macy's acquired our company in 2015. Although Blue Mercury has evolved a lot since our founding, we still pride ourselves on being the friendly neighborhood cosmetics store where you can get coveted luxury beauty products with expert, honest advice. While we have had spectacular success, we have also seen spectacular failure. And today, we will talk to you about both. Marla and I started Blue Mercury when she was 29 and I was 31 years old. While Marla's resume and background today look pristine, she's always had to hustle. She grew up in a middle-class family in Oakland, California. Her father never went to college. She started working at his insurance agency when she was in high school, reconciling his accounting books and balancing his cash accounts. She also worked on Saturdays at a clothing boutique so she could have extra spending money. She studied economics at UC Berkeley and then worked as a, a consultant at McKinsey and Company. She went on to Harvard and got a joint degree in business and public policy. After she graduated from business school, she took a job at a buyout fund. She had a big pile of money and she bought companies and put them together with other companies. I was bored. <laughs> I didn't like any of the companies we were buying and I felt like I wasn't really building anything. We were buying office products, distributors, maintenance providers, and electrical contractors. I met Barry when we tried to buy his company that he had started when he was 22 years old. He was a crazy entrepreneur who believed anything was possible. When Barry was eight years old, his father called him into his den and said, Barry, you can be anything in the world as long as you own your own company. I don't even care if you become a garbage collector as long as it's your own thing. He became a serial entrepreneur. When he was 10 years old, he was shoveling snow and had contracts with every house in the neighborhood. When he was 10 years old, I'm uh, sorry, in high school, he started another company. In college, he had another successful business. 
And after graduating from Cornell University, he started his fourth company with his brother, which became one of America's largest chain store maintenance companies, U.S. Maintenance, which was acquired by a Fortune 500 company. Every time I would talk to Barry, he would say, why are you working for someone else? Why don't you start your own company and do something you love? I'd always known I wanted to run a company. I hadn't really imagined myself starting one. But Barry can be very persuasive, and I thought, he's right, we can start a company. All we needed was an idea. In 1997, while I was at Harvard Business School, an obscure entrepreneur came and talked to us about the internet and how e-commerce was going to change the world. I didn't even have an email account then, and there was no such thing as Google. So this e-commerce thing was really hard to imagine. This entrepreneur was Jeff Bezos. He spoke to us in a small room, about 30 people were there, and explained how his three-year-old company, Amazon, was going to revolutionize the purchase of books. Imagine, just books? I was intrigued. By 1998, when I graduated, the first dot-com boom was in full swing. Barry and I started to ideate and figure out which products we could bring to the internet. So I took a step back and said, what do I love? Well, that was easy, makeup and beauty products. I was always a beauty junkie. This is a picture of the very first beauty store I ever shopped at. It was created in 1970 in Berkeley, California, about a half mile from where I grew up. I had facials when I was in high school before anyone knew what facials were. And I w when I lived in Boston, I drove 30 minutes to buy my MAC lipstick from Bendel's. I was obsessed with beauty products. When I moved to Washington, D.C., I discovered a little beauty boutique in Georgetown called EFX. It carried a couple of interesting cosmetics brands that at that point were new, NARS and Kiehl's, to name a few. I would say it was like a light bulb went off in my head, but it was more like fireworks. When we were growing up, everything was sold at the department stores. Kitchen goods, electronics, furniture and clothes. That was the only place you went to shop. By the late 1990s, everything had been pulled out of the department stores. Kitchen goods by William Sonoma, electronics by Best Buy, and furniture by Pottery Barn. And everything else was being brought online. Books by Amazon, toys by eToys, and shoes by Zappos. We thought, why not cosmetics? Back then, you could really only buy cosmetics at department stores or drug stores. There were no freestanding cosmetic stores at all. Imagine, no Sephora, no Mac stores, no Ulta. I was 29 and didn't like the experience of shopping for cosmetics in department stores. In 1999, everything was still sold behind glass counters. I found the staff to be a little bit snobby, looking you up and down, trying to determine if you were going to spend money before they would decide to help you. As a young woman in my 20s, it was intimidating. Shopping for cosmetics was a problem that needed a solution. Many people don't know that Blue Mercury actually started as an e-commerce only company. 1999 was the height of the first internet boom. We pitched a venture firm on the idea of selling luxury cosmetics which were not offered on the internet yet. We knocked on the doors of everyone we knew and we raised a million dollars in just two weeks with just an idea. That was the start of Blue Mercury. We started to build our website and a large organization around us. We had 20 employees before we even had our first sale. 60 days after incorporating the company, we realized there were three other competitors, each with at least $10 million in funding. This was 10 times our war chest. We quickly went out to raise more money and weren't able to do it uh, due to the competitors. Our company was pre-revenue and had a really high cash burn rate. That's fancy speak for a lot going out and nothing coming in. Then NASDAQ crashed in February of 2000 and all the venture funds stopped investing. Everywhere we turned, the doors were slammed in our face. Soon we were down to our last $150,000 in the bank and we were in trouble. Marl and I decided we were going to go and buy that beauty store in Georgetown. As our company continued to burn money, the end was clearly in sight for us, 
and we realized our only way to achieve a return for our current investors was to purchase the store. It would give us a steady supply of cosmetics, a warehouse for our internet business, and customers walking in the front door, which seemed to be sorely lacking on our e-commerce site. We never planned to own a store because the investment community wanted pure e-commerce plays. The retail store combined with a website strategy was actually frowned upon at the time. But in the end, it became the wave of the future, and Blue Mercury was, coined, uh, was credited with coining the phrase, clicks and bricks. Yes, we invented that. <laughs> Just when things were looking bright, we learned that a company named Sephora, whose business model was very similar to ours, owned by LVMH, a billion-dollar luxury giant, was entering the US, and one of their first 10 stores was going to be placed right next to ours in Georgetown. We had just barely escaped the clutches of bankruptcy, and this is what comes next? With the added competition of Sephora, at the very beginning of our evolution, we had to learn who we were, what we were about, and define our point of difference. So we opened a second store in DuPont Circle. But it was our third store that we opened in 2001 in Philadelphia, which was a key turning point. In 2001, we set our sights on Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia. I had grown up in Philadelphia and knew the community. We could even sleep on my sister's couch. It was a shoot the moon moment for us. We used all of our leftover cash to test a store in a completely different market. If it failed, we probably would not have been able to expand. But it was a smashing success. We started to gain momentum. Although our business was generating positive cash flow to acceler accelerate our expansion, we needed to raise more money. We were introduced to a group called Capital Investors, an angel investment group that met monthly over dinner in Washington, DC, included the founders of America Online, Steve Case and Ted Leonsis. This was a big deal, as AOL was the Google of its day. Barry and I will never forget this dinner meeting. We walked into the room with a very thick, very buttoned up business plan and made our pitch with numbers, spreadsheets, pie charts, and graphs. At the end of the pitch, Ted Leonson said, Ted, Ted Leonson said, you're boring me with details. Just tell me in a few sentences that you can become a public company and I can get rich if I invest. Before we could even respond, he proceeded to tell us the story of his fabulous investment in Outback Steakhouse. One bloomin' onion costs $7. 500 bloomin' onions per day were $3,500, and that plus all the other food made a $2 million restaurant. That was one Outback store. This is what 10 Outbacks look like, then 100 Outbacks, and then poof, a public offering. We walked out of the room waited for a half an hour by the bar, not sure what to expect. When we came back in, Steve Case told us that the answer, was, the answer was yes. We took as much money as we could get this time because we had learned the hard lesson of what it felt like to almost run out of money. We started aggressively opening stores and had a really compelling business model. We had a high return on invested capital. We would spend 200000 to build a store and get that back before the end of the first year with a 10-year lock on that retail site. We used internal cash to keep expanding. We got up to 10 stores. Although we were a small company, we had an outsized reputation and had become known as the new Starbucks of cosmetics. The nice thing about our retail stores was that they really produced cash. We only needed capital to accelerate store openings. During Blue Mercury's lifetime until 2006, we'd only raised about three and a half million dollars. As we accelerated our store openings and improved our business model, our revenue growth accelerated even more. In January 2005, we started getting calls from public companies and private equity funds that were interested in buying Blue Mercury. We hired an investment banker. On June 15, 2006, we recapitalized the business. We took on a new partner, the Invis Group, a private equity firm made up of former BCG and McKinsey and company consultants. They gave us the firepower and insight to expand nationwide and start our private label business. We created two brands, M61 Powerful Skin Care and Luna Naster Cosmetics. And in March of 2015, 
Macy's acquired the company. We are so happy to be part of the Macy's family. Terry and Jeff have incredible vision and have provided us with the resources we've needed to accelerate our expansion and invest in our infrastructure. Macy's is the fifth largest e-commerce player in the country and has an amazing innovation lab in San Francisco. It's been an incredible 18-year journey and it is still continuing. Here are our insights and thoughts to help you think through disrupting an industry and starting and scaling a new venture. You can start from scratch or do this in your existing business or company. Lesson number one, get in the game and stay in the game. Getting in the game is just the beginning. It's staying in the game that counts. Or as Nike says, just do it. We saw an opportunity and started a business. We started Blue Mercury as an internet only business. Six months after we started, the business concept completely changed. Today there's a technical term for having an idea that doesn't work. The word is not failure. Today it's called a pivot, made popular by Eric Reese, the lean startup. You start, fail, and quickly pivot to the next strategy. Has anybody in the audience today heard of the company called Bourbon? Bourbon was a location check-in app which enabled friends to check in, make future plans, and post pictures. The company wasn't working. The founders looked at their app and realized that the most used feature was the uploading of photos. So they changed to a photo sharing app known today as Instagram. The Blue Mercury retail opportunity never would have availed itself to us unless we were in the game. The dot-com business failed at first because we were just too early. But we figured it out by buying the retail store, and now we have come full circle and have a sizable e-commerce business. Lesson number two, solve a problem. We saw a problem and we solved it. People were dissatisfied with the way cosmetics were sold. They were sold from behind glass counters. It was an unsatisfying customer experience. In every problem, there is an opportunity. This is where ideas come from. Vinod Kosla, the founder of Sun Microsystems, says the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. No problem, no solution, no company. Always ask yourself, what is the problem you are solving for your customer? Lesson number three, Droom. Don't run out of money. <laughs> if you run out of money, it is game over. We almost did. Try to live long enough to live forever. You need to survive long enough for good things to happen to you. At Blue Mercury, we almost ran out of money in the first six months. Raise money when you can get it. Focus on keeping your costs low, driving revenue. Be scrappy. I remember the old days when I didn't want to purchase office supplies. We still have this funny habit of collecting paper clips from documents that are about to be shredded and taking all the pads and papers from our hotel rooms. Yes, that's us, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those days of worrying about making payroll. I remember the times of having to lay people off. If you remember nothing from today's speech, nothing else, remember, Droom, don't run out of money. Lesson number four, the first year is the hardest. In software terms, the first year, you are going from version zero to version one. It is really buggy as you are inventing something new. V1 to V2 is buggy too, but nothing like V0 to V1. When we almost ran out of money, I had a few days where I couldn't get out of bed. We had convinced all of these amazing people to join our crusade, and we felt like we were letting them down. You're trying to figure out your business, trying to figure out how to inspire people, and doing everything yourself the first year. It was the most difficult year of our professional lives to date. But once you get through that year, you start to get the hang of it. You have to sprint your first year, then you ease into the marathon. Overnight successes are so rare. Lesson number five, angels are your friend. We raised angel capital in small increments, meaning we had a lot of investors with a little ownership in, of each. This gave us the freedom and control to make the right choices for the business without pressure. Also, after the first six months when we almost went bankrupt, we learned how to run with extremely low overhead. There was no way we were going to run out of money again. 
Because we had so little money, we had to focus on cash flow and profit so we could actually pay ourselves. This, month, this meant that we had to build a valuable business with products that customers really wanted to pay for. The constraint of money made us smarter. If I wanted to start a new business today, I would make sure I had enough money to get through one year of the startup phase while I at least found what I like to call an MVP, or at least a minimum viable product. Lesson number six, break the rules. We decided that when we started opening stores that our people and our culture were going to be our secret weapon. We created a radical human resource model that everyone said would not work. I don't know how many times we heard, you can't do this, this is not how it works in our industry. By completely ignoring advice we were given, we revolutionized the beauty industry. When we started in the cosmetics industry, the majority of employees were part-time workers and were only given 15 to 25 hours per week of work and no work during the low seasons, January and summertime. We gave our staff full-time year-round work benefits and a true career path. We gave them a place where they could develop and grow, and they became part of the Blue Mercury family. Today, we have staff that started as sales associates at $15 an hour, and now they make over $100,000 a year. Most of our store staff did not have the opportunity to go to college, but we have taught them how to lead and manage and achieve a level of success they never imagined they would have. We put our people first, and they are our enduring secret weapon. By breaking industry rules, we created a better experience for our staff and therefore for our customers. Lesson number seven, climb the stairs. Your job in your startup and business is to drive revenue, preferably profitably. I believe startups hit certain revenue levels and then coast for a while and then need a burst of energy to climb to the next level. There are natural stair steps, zero to a million dollars, one million to five million, five to 10 million, 10 to 20, 20 to 50, 50 to 100, and 100 million to 250 million. If you can get to one million, you can get to five million. If you can get to five, you can get to 10, and so on. If you're not at one of these, if you're at one of these levels and you wanna hit the next level, you need to take a step back and figure out your exact strategic and financial plan. I remember doing this at the $5 million level. We knew exactly how many stores and how much e-commerce traffic we needed to grow from five to 10 million. We put a plan in place and executed directly against that plan. It was so powerful that we went straight from nine million to 17 million, skipping the $10 million level. So figure out where you are on the stair step, figure out what your revenue drivers are and put together a detailed plan to hit the next stair step. Lesson number eight, keep looking for white space. You cannot rest on your laurels. The pace of business and competition is faster than it's ever been. We are continually seeking out and creating new revenue and value streams by listening, watching, and observing our customers. This is why we started the brand business. Six years ago, the Blue Mercury customer kept coming in and saying, I love natural products, but I don't like their efficacy. Other customers were coming in saying, I love the dermatologist brands, but they are full of chemicals I don't want in my products. So in 2011, we created M61, a vegan, paraben-free cos cosmeceutical brand. Last year, we launched Luna and Aster, a vegan cosmetics line for the girl on the go. Without laser focus and detailed observation of our customers, we would never have been able to conceptualize the private brand business. To build an enduring, scalable company, you must keep finding growth and look for the next white space. Lesson number nine, do something you love. It's much easier to work 24 seven on something you're passionate about. We love the cosmetics industry. It's full of creativity, technology advances, and great entrepreneurs. If you find something you love, you don't notice the sleepless nights and the stress. Okay, well, that might not be entirely true, but it certainly makes it much easier to go through the tough times and put in the hours. Choosing something you're passionate about also has a cascading effect. It's easier to explain your vision. It makes it easier to convince others to join your company. Jim Collins, author of Good to Great, says, you should pick 
three things in what you do. Number one, what are you good at? Number two, what are you born to do? And number three, what can you get paid for? The question of passion comes from the second point. What are you born to do? When are you the happiest? Lesson number 10. You can't do it all, but you can have it all. Life happens while you are building your company and your careers. We built our family while we were building Blue Mercury. We have three children, aged 13, 11, and 10. Our 13-year-old Ariel was built when we were opening store number five. Our 11-year-old Sophie was born when we opened store number eight. And our son, Luke, was born when we were opening stores 12 through 20. Some people say, oh, now is not a good time for me to start a company or take on a new role. Others say, I just started my company, so I can't start a family. I think that anyone can make the case that it's never the right time to do either. Live your life, build your company, build your career. We'll figure it out. Each and every one of you is on an incredible journey, building your careers, your companies, and building your lives. Build your own journey. I always say do it in your own way and find your own path. And remember, we need more disruptors. We leave you with a list of great books that Marla and I really love. Thank you. So I think we're open for Q&A now if anyone has a question. Only easy questions. One or two quick ones. Pardon? One or two quick ones. One or two quick ones, OK. Why don't you go ahead? Thank you so much for being here. I enjoy shopping in your store, Lawn Cantata. Your staff's very helpful. My question is, as an entrepreneurial company and really with growth, how do you relinquish control? How do you keep it all straight when you have over 100 stores and just getting everything done? And I'm just curious as to that. I mean, I think as always, it starts with getting the right people on the bus and making sure that everyone is aware of mission. So our mission has always been really straightforward. It's to be the best at giving beauty advice. And everyone on our team knows that. And as entrepreneurs over the years, we've had to give up pieces and parts of everything we do. So I used to run all the stores, which I love, and I'm happiest when I'm visiting in stores. Uh, but, but now I can't do that. I can't interview everybody who joins our team. So what I do instead is do things like every Friday I have a call with new store managers that are coming out of our Blue Mercury University in Princeton, New Jersey. So you build another practice and then you let go. Uh, Barry, I'm sure, has something to add, but he does all of our real estate and store development. And I used to completely be involved with him on that. And, he does that all on his own. I think Marla and I are so involved on the business on a daily basis, and Terry's been an incredible leader for us, and we thank him for everything. And he's really given us the autonomy uh, and freedom to really think like entrepreneurs, and we're still able to flex our entrepreneurial muscles inside the business, and we're always thinking about breaking the rules on a daily basis, and we disseminate that out to our team. So it's not just getting the right people on the bus, but it's getting them on the bus and in the right seat. And Marla and I still interview and meet with every single manager uh, that joins our company. People say that, you know, I'm so surprised that Barry's so involved in what a package says or a flyer that's going out and I'm looking at every single word. The answer is I do. One time somebody accused me of saying, hey, Barry, you know what? Sometimes you're just like the sailor that reacts to every wave that hits the boat. I took that as a compliment. The answer is yes, that's why I get paid. I look at every single detail in the company. There's nothing so, uh, that's too small for us. We're obsessive about the detail. We just believe that that's where companies succeed, in the detail. We're very, very focused, and we're very, very data-driven. 